Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining me, and uh, happy Canada Day. So, um, you know, today is the day that Canada became a country on uh, the 1st of July. But as we know, right in America here, we celebrate the 4th of July. So I'm waiting for my kids to all go through school so I can learn a little bit more about American history. But one thing I do know is that July 4th this year is on a Saturday. So RIT will be observing the 4th of July on Friday. As a result of that, we won't have class this Friday. And instead, we will move Friday's class to tomorrow. So I get to see all of you and you all get to see me. Although I guess C is a bit of a misnomer here. But we'll get together tomorrow at 4 o'clock to go over an example of a Rankin cycle, which we'll introduce today. And speaking of announcements, maybe that's a bit of a strange segue there, but you should have just gotten an email from me, and there's an announcement on the My Courses page. So we are currently here, July the 1st, and we will have our second midterm on Thursday, July the 9th. That's next Thursday. So just over a week from now, we will run the same logistics that we did last time, so the exam will run in the same time periods. And I'll run a meeting in the end of the exam in case people have questions. We will again have 10 multiple choice questions that are delivered via quiz and two long answer problems that are delivered. Uh, so the questions will be delivered as they were last time through content on the website and then you'll upload them like you would upload a homework problem. So this second midterm covers everything from the beginning of open systems up until the material that we will cover on. So today we'll introduce Rankin cycles. Tomorrow we will do an example for Rankin cycles and then Monday is a review lecture. And that is the end of the content for this first midterm. So basically everything up until the four component rank and cycles that we've kind of hinted at but won't formally introduce until today. And then on Monday, we'll have a review class. So I think there's two ways that can go. So I've created a review lecture and I've posted that lecture on, on the My Courses webpage. So it's under content for week eight. Now, typically what I would do was post my lecture notes, which are also available. But then I usually give students the option between me doing the review lecture or just having kind of an ask me anything style review session. So every time people have chosen that ask me anything style review. So I'm intending on Monday to just come here with material unprepared and just field your questions. Now, if it turns out that we don't have questions to field, I can just go into the review lecture. But my plan for that review lecture will basically just be to answer your questions about the new material or the material that will be covered before, as we move into the exam. So does anyone have questions about this second midterm? All right. Well, that sounds good. So I guess before that we'll do, you know, because this midterm's coming up, we'll kind of go over a little bit the things that we need to know. So the first thing is that when we're dealing with these open systems, what we want to be able to do is have a process, right? As engineers, if we have a good process, that means that we'll get to a good answer more often than not. So when we're dealing with open systems, I think there's this kind of four part process that we need to do. So the first thing we want to do is figure out where our system begins and ends. So where are we going to draw our control volume? Then we do conservation of mass. Once we understand what's going on with the mass in the system, we can do conservation of energy. And then sometimes, particularly if we want to know if the process is possible, we can do a second law analysis just to verify that entropy is indeed being generated in our control volume. 
And if we can do steps one through four, we'll get symbolic solutions for whatever it is that we're looking for. Maybe it's the power developed by a turbine or the heat transfer that goes into a fluid in a boiler. But once we can do that, we need to be able to fix the states in order to get a numerical answer for whatever problem we're working on. And to do that, we need to be able to answer the question, what's the fluid? Now, this is always a two-part question, because if the answer is water or something like it that's near a vapor dome, we have to say, okay, what's the phase? Is it subcooled liquid? Is it a two-phase mixture? Or is it superheated vapor? And if it's an ideal gas, then we have to ask ourselves, are we saying that the specific heat is constant? Or are we saying that the specific heat is variable? So when we look at conservation of mass, we have this equation, right? Now, I'm going to write down some common assumptions. That doesn't mean that these assumptions are assumptions that we make every single time. So one of the things that you might see on the exam is when we're doing an open system problem, maybe I'll force you to relax some of these assumptions so that you can demonstrate that you understand how to use these equations. But if we're talking about conservation of mass, we will often say that a system is at steady state, which means we get rid of this term, which tells us how the mass is accumulating inside our control volume. And we'll often assume that the system or the component that we're looking at has one inlet and one outlet. If that's the case, conservation of mass becomes somewhat trivial in that it tells us that the mass flow rate in is equal to the mass flow rate out. We also have to deal with the first law or conservation of energy. Common assumptions that we'll make here include that the system is at steady state, so we're not accumulating energy inside our control volume. We'll often say that a control volume is at one inlet or one outlet, so the summation signs go away. Oftentimes, we won't be concerned with the change in the kinetic energy or the change in the potential energy, so those terms will go away. Then, always, or often, but not always, we'll say that the system is a simple system where it either has a power component or a heat transfer rate component, but not necessarily both. So we've seen that with things like turbines and pumps, where sometimes we'll cancel out one of these two terms. We'll also see in cycles that we'll neglect friction losses and heat losses in between different components. So what's interesting here is that this first law, one of the tricky things about the first law for open systems is that the equation looks different if we're in imperial units or in metric units. So here, this version is for imperial units, and you can tell because I'm not, I don't just have V squared over 2, this kinetic energy term, but I also have to divide by GC. So if I don't do that, then what happens is I don't get the right quantity. Right? So these quantities should be the same as H, which is energy per unit mass, or in imperial units, BTU per pound mass. And if I don't divide by GC, I don't get that. But even after I divide by GC, I'd get something like, if my velocity was in feet per second, I'd get something like foot pounds per pound mass. So I'd have to divide that by 778 to turn it into BTU per pound mass, which is the unit that I get when I look H up in the tables. So the kinetic and potential energy terms are always going to give you troubles if they stick around, but they give you even more trouble, right? It's like uh, double plus bad, I guess, if it's in imperial units, right? So you got to sort of be aware if those terms stick around because units will be a problem. If we look at the second law, the rate equation for the second law looks like this. Assumptions that we'll often make are that the system is at steady state, so we're not accumulating entropy inside our control volume. We'll often have one inlet and one outlet. Hopefully, if you get a choice, I would say it's probably a good idea to say that this system is adiabatic because if you do, then I think you'll get rid of this term 
if you're going to make a mistake, or at least if I'm going to make a mistake on this equation, probably I'll make that mistake here. Q dot comes from the first law, so it should be the same sign as you get for the first law inside the system. But this T surroundings, there's two things that we can mess up here. So first, this T surroundings should be the temperature outside of my control volume, ideally on the boundary, but if not outside the control volume. And also because it's not a delta T term, this should be in absolute temperatures. So it's got to be in Rankine if you're in imperial units or Kelvin if you're in metric units. Now, the thing that I know about any process in the universe is that entropy is generated. So that means the entropy generation rate must be positive for this to happen in real life. So for all of these equations, or at least for conservation of energy and the second law, we'll get to a point where we need to find delta H or delta S. So we need to know what the fluid is. So if the fluid's water, then we need to know what the phase is. And if the fluid is an ideal gas, we'll need to know, is it constant specific heat or variable specific heat? So how do I find H or delta H? If this is a superheated vapor or a two-phase liquid, probably what I'm going to do is look it up in the tables that are in the textbook, right? We used to teach this class where um, the reference material was the FE handbook. And that's kind of nice if you're going to take the FE exam when you're done. But for this version of the class, we'll have the same materials that were available last time, which include both the metric and imperial tables that are in the textbook. If it's a subcooled liquid, meaning that it's subcooled liquid on both sides of your process, then you could approximate delta H as the specific heat times the change in temperature. Now, technically, this should be CP, the specific heat at constant pressure, but for subcooled liquids, CP and CV are the same thing. For an ideal pump, we get this problem where we can't really use remember we also had this approximation for subcooled liquids where h of a subcooled liquid was approximately equal to hf of a saturated liquid at the same temperature we can't really do that for ideal pumps because delta t across an ideal pump is zero so if you do that you'll get the delta h across an ideal pump is zero and while it would be pretty awesome to have a pump that would work without plugging into the wall that can't happen in the universe so we know that even an ideal pump has to consume power so instead what we do is we look at this delta h term we say that the change in the specific internal energy is zero but the change in the specific enthalpy will be driven by the change in pressure multiplied by the specific volume and since this specific volume won't change across the pump we can approximate this by either the specific volume at three or the specific volume at four. And we can approximate either one of those as being the specific volume of the saturated liquid at whatever temperature we're at for either one of those states. For water, it will always essentially be one divided by a thousand. For an ideal gas, we'll get that the change in the specific enthalpy is equal to Cp times delta T, but here, unlike with water or other subcooled liquids, it matters that we pick CP because CP and CV will be different values for ideal gases. So how do we find S or delta S? So again, it's nice if it's a two-phase mixture or a superheated vapor because we're just going to look that up in the table. We might have to interpolate, but hopefully we're getting pretty familiar with that. For ideal turbines and pumps, what happens is we typically will make these isentropic, but that falls out of the second law after assuming that a process is at steady state, adiabatic, one inlet, one outlet, and ideal, meaning that the entropy generation rate is zero. If you do that, you'll find that delta S across an ideal turbine or pump is equal to zero. So these will be isentropic pumps. Delta S across a subcooled liquid is given as Cp times the natural log of T2 over T1. This kind of looks like Cp times delta T, except that instead of delta T, we would get the natural log of T2 over T1. 
Now, remember that because these are not delta T terms, we have to treat these temperatures or we have to convert these temperatures to either Kelvin or Rankine so that they're absolute temperatures. Delta S for ideal gases is a little bit tricky because we can never find delta S for an ideal gas in a table. Instead, if we're going to use the table for ideal gases to find delta S, we will look up the change in S superscript zero. So this is basically the change in the specific entropy that's driven by the temperature difference. But there's also going to be some change in the specific entropy that's driven by the change in pressure. And that's given by this second term here. So this first option, option A, is the most accurate option because we're using information from tables. But it's not all information from tables. We still have some analytical work or some work that we have to do on our calculators. Options B and C are options that we would use if we have constant specific heats. You can tell that because we have CP and CV in the equations. When we do that, we're assuming that CP and CV are constant. So if you ever write down an equation like this, and it has CP and CV in it, and it's an exam, and I'm asking you to write down your assumptions, you need to write down that the specific heat is constant, or at least that's what you're assuming. So we use option B when we know the temperatures and the pressures, which is common for open systems. And we use option C when we know the temperatures and the specific volumes, which is more common for closed systems. Again, the accuracy using A is better than the accuracy using B and C. So this is continued from a previous lecture, but one of the things that I didn't specifically talk about in class that I wanted to cover today was how do we find delta H across an isentropic process when the working fluid is ideal gas, right? So here I'm also going to assume that this is constant specific heat. You can do this with variable specific heat, but we won't cover that on the exam this time. It will be something that we'll deal with on the final. We know that delta H is CP times delta T. But how do I find delta T across an isentropic turbine, for example, when I have an ideal gas and delta S is equal to zero? So if I'm trying to find delta H when delta S is zero and the fluid is an ideal gas, right? So there's kind of a chain of assumptions that goes along with this. So we can't just use these assumptions whenever we want. But I would use, I would look on my equation sheet. In my equation sheet, there's going to be a section for isentropic processes with ideal gases. And some of those equations are going to have K in the exponent. Remember, K is the ratio of CP to CV. So if I use K, I also have to write down that I'm assuming CP and CV are constant. So this only works when I'm assuming constant specific heat. But in this case, let's say I didn't know the outlet temperature of my isentropic turbine but I knew the difference in pressures and I knew the inlet temperature. Then if I had air where K would be approximately 1.4, then I'd be able to use this equation to find T2. I could do a similar thing if this was a closed system where a piston was moving up and down and maybe I know the volume ratios across my compression stroke, let's say. Then again, I would use this equation for an isentropic process with ideal gases. Again, it's got K in the exponent. That's kind of the tell here, right? Or if I wanted to relate the pressures to the specific volumes, then I could use this equation. Although personally in this class, I don't think I ever use this equation. You could derive all of these equations yourself. They all fall out of the equations that I gave above. I think that this changed to A and B on my PowerPoint slide, but this is options B and C, I think on the previous slide. All we're doing here is we set delta S equal to zero, and then we manipulate these equations to get uh, these equations up here using the identity that R is equal to CP minus CV. You're never going to have to derive these equations in this class, but sometimes it is helpful to know where things come from. So if we're dealing with these equations that have K in the exponent, 
then we need to use a constant specific heat approximation for this exam. There's a way to do this with variable specific heat, but I won't kind of spring that on you now. Uh, instead, we'll deal with that later in the course. So all of these equations require us to assume that specific heats are not changing as the temperature is changing. This is not true in real life, but it's not unreasonable provided our temperature differences are fairly small. Here's a quick example of an isentropic compressor. So here we're told the temperature and pressure at the inlet of this compressor. Remember a compressor is like a pump, but the working fluid is an ideal gas. So its purpose is to increase the pressure, right? So here we go from 100 kilopascals up to 800 kilopascals. And this problem asks us to find the power per unit mass flowing through the system. Here, because it's a compressor, if we assume that this is a steady state, adiabatic, one inlet, one outlet, and we neglect changes in kinetic and potential energy, and we further assume that this process is isentropic, then first we'll get that the power consumed by the compressor is m dot times h in minus h out. We'll further assume that the specific heats are constant. So we'll change this delta H into Cp times T in minus T out. So we now have an expression for the compressor. But what we really want is compressor power divided by mass flow rate. So this is just going to be Cp times T in minus T out. Now I'm told T in, and they're nice to me. They even told me this in Kelvin, but I don't know T out. So how do I find T out? Right? So here, this is just saying, I don't know the compressor power. I do know CP. I know the temperature in, but I don't know the temperature out. We need to find the temperature at the outlet. So here, we can assume this process is isentropic. And after we do that, then we open up our analysis to be able to use this equation that's got k in the exponent. So this is the equation that I want to use for this isentropic process. I have k in the exponent. I know that k for air is 1.4. So here I can just rearrange this. It's not that bad. I multiply by t1 on both sides. I notice that these are not temperatures that's, that are delta t's. They're temperatures that stand alone. So I need to be in Kelvin but I've already got the temperature in Kelvin, so that's not too bad. I know P2 is 800, P1 is 100. They're both in the same unit, so it's just going to be 800 divided by 100, or, or 8, right? So Cp over Cv is 1.4. So I can put this into my calculator, and I find that the temperature at the outlet of my turbine, or of my compressor, sorry, is 543 degrees Kelvin. So that makes sense, right? Because here my temperature is increasing, right? So T out is bigger than T in. So that means I'm going to get negative power, which is what I expect because a compressor is like a pump. So when I put, now I know this, the only thing that I don't know is the power divided by the mass flow rate. Now I can work this out. CP, I would look this up in a textbook too, but for air in metric, Cp is one kilojoule per kilogram Kelvin because the metric system is great, right? We cancel out our degrees Kelvin and we get here that our compressor power per unit of mass flowing through the system is minus 243 kilojoules per kilogram. So this is just a quick example of how we use this isentropic relationship for cases when we have ideal gases. This makes sense because it's a negative number and that's what we're expecting for compressors, which are like pumps. Now the main focus of the lecture today is going to be talking about vapor power systems, which are called Rankine cycles. So we've been looking at these heat engines, right? And one way to construct a heat engine is to generate power with a turbine. So now the turbine the inlet should be some high pressure, high enthalpy fluid, right? But as we go through here, the pressure goes down. Really what we want to do is get back to the inlet. We want to get this low pressure, 
steam or maybe some high quality fluid that's in here and we want to basically have it be this high pressure high enthalpy steam again so we don't do this directly because then we would you know going back up here we'd put in more power than what we get out in the turbine and our heat engine wouldn't be very good because it wouldn't produce power so instead what we do is we take this hot fluid right that's mostly steam and we condense it so that it's a liquid the reason we like doing this is because then to increase the pressure doesn't take that much power if we do it in our pump because it doesn't take much power to increase the pressure of a pump because it's incompressible now we have a high pressure liquid but we want high pressure steam so what we do is we find some kind of exothermic reaction right maybe this is burning coal and maybe this is some kind of nuclear power plant right but you know a lot of times when we mechanical engineers get heat what we want to do is boil water so we look for some kind of heat source so that we can take this high pressure liquid boil it and get high pressure steam and then we can run back through the turbine again right so we can think about this particular cycle which is a at least the most basic Rankine cycle that we can have is this four component cycle what we want to do is just run the turbine and the rest of this the condenser the pump and the boiler we're really just running so that we can get back to the inlet of the turbine so why do we care about this right so why why am i teaching you this right it turns out that um power is pretty important right um i don't know where you are but here i got my lights on right some of my led lights are uh you know making it so i can see right so i need power for that i'm talking to you through uh sort of the magic of a computer right i'm using a, a television screen here on my computer so that i can see you right and some of you might even be uh watching me on a cell phone right all of these things require power right and in the united states there's a couple different ways that we get power right so we've kind of moved to the dominant mode being natural gas power plants which we're going to learn about so natural gas power plants don't run on Rankine cycles but coal power plants do and that's kind of our second biggest way to produce power and so do nuclear power plants so that's kind of our third biggest way of producing power so in total about 45 percent of the energy that we use here in the united states comes from Rankine cycles right so when i look at this so coal-fired power plants are Rankine cycles nuclear powered power plants are Rankine cycles some green energy options are also Rankine cycles essentially we just need enough heat to boil some kind of fluid right now water is maybe the best fluid to boil here because um we put a lot of enthalpy into the into the fluid as we're boiling it right because it watch pot never boils it takes a lot of energy to boil water but some of these other cases where maybe we don't get quite as much heat maybe you're using some other fluid that's bouncing back and forth across a vapor dome maybe something like a refrigerant right so again about 45 percent of the energy that was from 2019 there's different stats depending on which version of the textbook that you have um you know maybe a decade ago or two decades ago maybe that number was as high as 80 percent so our energy mix here in the united states is changing mostly dominated by us moving more towards natural gas power plants um and away from coal-fired power plants so what does a Rankine cycle look like, right? This is what a coal power plant might look like, right? So it's got different components, different subsystems, right? So the Rankine cycle, right, is kind of the heart here. This is the part that we're going to be analyzing, right? This is the part we want to learn about in thermodynamics. But a lot of the parts are kind of outside that heart of the system, right? So the first part is the boiler, right? So this is, you know, when I think about a coal-fired power plant, I'm kind of also thinking about, um, you know, an old school steam locomotive where there's somebody, you know, in the engine room shoveling coal into the boiler, right? That's essentially what we're doing in a coal power plant, although we, we do it in a much uh, better way, I'm sure, than when we were first running locomotives across the country. But, you know, essentially we're burning coal to make heat, right? And that heat is an input into the heart of our Rankine cycle because we use that heat to boil water right again you give a mechanical engineer heat and oftentimes what we want to do is boil water 
The textbook talks about subsystem B. This is the heart of the system, right? And in the most basic Rankine cycle, we need at least a turbine, a condenser, a pump, and a boiler. Why do we want this turbine? So you could probably have a system that just generates mechanical power that has a spinning shaft, but then you kind of have to use all of that locally, right? You've got this spinning shaft, maybe you hook some gears up to it, and that's great if, you know, you have a windmill and maybe you're using it to make grain or something. But uh, what we really want to do is put this power onto the electrical grid. So we need to make friends with an electrical engineer who's going to use this spinning shaft that's in our turbine and hook it up to an electrical generator so that we can put this out as electrical power onto the grid. The other thing that we need to do right? Because in our, just like, so over here in the boiler, we had to add heat to boil this water. But after we come out of the turbine, we want to condense the fluid. We want to get water on the other side of the condenser. So what we need to do is we have to reject this heat somewhere. Remember Calvin and Planck told us that we need to, in order to run a cycle like this, we can take input heat energy and turn it into work, but we have to have some kind of heat sink, right? So this is the heat sink. This is the thing that you see on The Simpsons, right? So here you have water running through here, right? This is uh, colder water, and it runs through here, and it absorbs heat from this condenser, right? So this is, on this side, we're cooling the fluid down, but that means we have to be heating something else up. So we're heating up this cooling water, and then it goes into this big cooling tower, right? So maybe there's some steam in here, and the steam is rising, but as the steam rises, it also condenses and then it falls back in here as cooled water and runs back through the loop. Now, it doesn't have to be done like this. So as I said, I grew up outside of Toronto, right, which is on the other side of Lake Ontario. And uh, what we did, there's a nuclear power plant not far outside of Toronto. And I actually did some consulting for that power plant. And one of the things that they do to cool down the plant, they don't have the big cooling towers. They're pulling water out of Lake Ontario. So if you pull water from deep enough in the lake, right? Maybe you've had this experience if you've swum in a freshwater lake that um, if you swim deep enough, you know, the top layer of the, of the water is warm. But after you get deep enough, you get, you know, to some line and it, there's this like demarcation where the temperature gets really cold, right? Because now the, the sunlight doesn't penetrate as deep, right? So you don't get as much heating. So when that happens, if you pull water from below that, you can get water that's close to four degrees Celsius, which is nice because that's the uh, that's water with the highest density is at about four degrees Celsius. So it's not always a cooling tower, but we need some heat sink in our system, right? So in our class, right, we'll always be talking about the central part, what I'm calling the heart of this system. And we'll do some different things to kind of increase the complexity as we move forward. But we always have to remember that there's these other components that we're not talking about. Like, where do we get the heat from? What do we do with the spinning shaft? And how do we remove the heat from inside this core component here? I just like this animation from the textbook, right? So here we've got a single fluid element and it's moving through our cycle, right? So it goes through the turbine, then it condenses, then we pump it up, then we uh, boil it, turn it back into steam. So you could think about some fluid element that goes through this whole cycle and it's changing phase back and forth and back and forth, just going around and around, right? And that's why we call this a cycle. So this is what a coal power plant looks like, right? Ultimately, what we're doing here is we take the chemical energy that's locked inside the coal. We turn that into heat energy. So that's one energy transaction, right? Then we turn that into enthalpy inside our system, right? And then we reduce that enthalpy in order to get mechanical power in the form of the spinning shaft. And then we turn that mechanical power into some electrical power that goes out onto the grid. So there's a whole host of energy transactions that are happening here. And what we know about the universe is that the universe takes a cut every time we have one of these energy transactions, right? So there's always reversibilities in every process. So every energy transaction you do, you're going to reduce your efficiency as you move through each one of these energy transactions, right? So we don't get as much energy as was locked away chemically in the coal.
we don't get as much power out as the heat that we put in, right? And then electrical generators are pretty good in terms of efficiency, but even they don't put out all this mechanical power as electrical power out onto the grid. So burning coal uh, in the U.S. here, that's still something that we do, although, like I said, we're trying to re reduce our dependence on coal power plants, but it lets us generate steam, which expands through a turbine. Right, so this is what a coal power plant looks like. Um, so that turns the shaft and generates electricity. Right, so we can do this same thing if we get heat in a different way. Right, so nuclear power plants also operate on Rankine cycles. So this is the textbook schematic for what a nuclear power plant looks like. Ultimately, the heart here, the Rankine cycle, is still here. Right, it's just now we're using this kind of like space age technology right the you know this this ability to split the atom and we're doing it this probably you know maybe the maybe the most impressive accomplishment we've had as uh you know scientific human beings right and the reason we do it is because it generates a whole lot of heat right and we use that heat to boil water right so it's a steam engine right we can also do this um with solar energy so we can have some reflectors that are bouncing heat into tubes that are running through the reflectors that boils some fluid right and anytime we have heat we have the potential to boil some other working fluid right so that's moving through here we have a rankin cycle there um there's geothermal ways to set up rankin cycles where again now we're taking uh heat from geothermal sources right we take that heat out we add some heat into a system and we try to find a fluid where when we add that much heat, then we boil it, right? So we're running through this cycle, and this is a Rankine cycle. So there's lots of different ways to run Rankine cycles. And I guess technically we don't really care in terms of how to analyze the cycle because the methodology is always going to be the same. We might get different answers if we have a different fluid, but we're still going to go through the same steps to analyze it. So once we, essentially, once we learn how to solve one type of Rankine problem, then we'll know how to solve all of them, right? So that's what we're going to try to do over the next couple of lectures, right? So Rankine cycles are steam power generation, right? So the difference between these different Rankine cycles comes from where we get the heat in. And often when we're characterizing different types of power plants, we characterize them by how we get the heat. Right? It's a coal power plant, or it's a nuclear power plant, or it's a natural gas power plant. Right? So that's important. But when we're trying to define the efficiency, the deficiency, the efficiency is always the same. It's the energy benefit divided by the energy cost. So for these heat engines, this is going to be net power divided by heat in. Right? Not net heat, but heat in. Right? How much coal did we have to burn? Right? So this uh, thermal efficiency is going to be the net power divided by the heat transfer into the system. So our simplest case, right? the most basic Rankine cycle is this one that's drawn here. So this is, if you go into a real power plant, it's going to be a lot more complicated than this. And we'll learn about some of the ways that we can complicate these systems. But ultimately, in the simplest case, the basic that you need to be a Rankine cycle is a turbine, a condenser, a pump, and a boiler. So we can analyze each of these individual components as an open system. Or to get that thermal efficiency equation, we can broaden out and look at this whole system as a closed system and look at what the net power and the net heat is or the heat in. So if we look at all these components, we have a boiler, right? We've done this before, right? Sneakily, right? We have a turbine that you know, decreases the enthalpy and, and turns that into power. We have a condenser that takes this, maybe it's superheated vapor that comes out of our turbine. Maybe it's a high quality two-phase mixture, but we want to cool that down. Probably we want to cool this down to get to a saturated liquid. But in the small example that we did, I only went to here because I wanted the heat rejection and the heat addition to happen at constant temperature. And then we use a pump to increase our pressure. And then we just keep going around and around and around. Now, in a more practical Rankine cycle, we'll probably, that condenser, ideally, going into the condenser, we have steam and not some condensed 
steam. So we don't want liquid water droplets inside of our turbine because they have the potential to damage the blades as they're whipping around inside the turbine. The condenser, we want to condense until we're a liquid because we also don't want any vapor inside of our pump. We just want liquid here. And then we add heat all the way from this saturated liquid to maybe a saturated vapor or hopefully a superheated vapor. We draw this on a TS diagram because we like to see these vertical lines for turbines and pumps when they're isentropic. Remember, isentropic, isentropic turbines and pumps tend to be ideal turbines and pumps if we can make a set of um, assumptions in our second law to see that ideal is the same as isentropic. So if I'm trying to find the thermal efficiency, I need to know the net power and the heat transfer in. So my net power involves the two components that care about power. So turbines produce power and pumps spend power, right? Or the pumps require power, right? So the textbook will tell you that the net power is going to be the turbine power minus the pump power. But they give you an expression for pump power that you can't get from the first law. So really they're putting absolute value signs here and they just don't really tell you that, right? Um, so heat transfer in, right? So in this four component system, this happens in the boiler. There's only one place we add heat here. So that is going to be the heat transfer rate into the boiler. This is HIP, right? Heat in is positive, so we get a positive value, right? M dot times H out minus H in, right? So the textbook will tell you that thermal efficiency for a Rankine cycle is turbine power minus pump power divided by heat transfer rate into the boiler. I'm going to tell you to get all these expressions from the first law and let the first law deal with the signs. But when you do that, you have to remember to add your turbine power to your pump power. And just, you know, again, I color code these things at least sometimes to remind myself that turbine power is positive, but pump power is negative. For each component, there are some assumptions that I want to make. So in this class, we'll say they're all at steady state. We'll often think of all these components as being one inlet, one outlet chained together in series. We'll usually say that the change in kinetic energy is negligible, as is the change in potential energy. Then, for each of these components, we will usually say that they're simple systems that either have heat transfer or power. So we'll make assumptions that things are adiabatic in turbines and pumps, or passive in the boiler and on the hot side of the condenser. And as we're moving between components, we'll make these assumptions that there are no friction losses in the lines and no heat losses in the lines. We make these assumptions uh, essentially for convenience because we don't want to have to fix a state at the exit of the turbine that would be different from the state at the inlet to the condenser. And these losses are typically fairly small compared to, say, the megawatts of power that we're going to develop inside of our power plant. <coughs> So for adiabatic components, we'll get that the power is m dot times h in minus h out. I remember this because the dwarves work really hard and they sing hi-ho, right? So this is always going to be h in minus h out for turbines and pumps. And I let the first law tell me what the sign's going to be. For passive components, that's components without fan blades inside, I'm going to say that w dot is zero and what I'll get from the first law usually, but not always, is that Q dot is going to be M dot times H out minus H in. So when I do that for these four components that are in my Rankine cycle, I get these equations. My turbine and my pump are M dot times H in minus H out, but my turbine has positive power and my pump has negative power. My condenser and my boiler are M dot times H out minus H in, my boiler is adding heat, so it's positive, and my condenser is rejecting heat, so it's negative. At this point, I'm at this place where I need to know what the fluid is because I want to be able to find these changes in enthalpy. I think the trickiest one here is if we're dealing with this isentropic pump, right, or this ideal pump, then this delta H is going to be the specific volume times the change in pressure. And then maybe we can use the isentropic efficiency 
to find the outlet of the real pump. So for thermal efficiency for heat engines, I've got this equation, turbine pump plus turbine power plus pump power divided by heat transfer rate in. I can substitute in the equations that I just derived from the first law for all of these components. If we're at steady state with one inlet and one outlet in all these components and they're chained together in series, then there's really only one mass flow rate. So my mass flow rates can drop out. And what I get is this expression for thermal efficiency that's a function of all of my enthalpies, right? So if it's a real Rankine cycle, then I need the real outlets to the turbine and the pump. And if it's an ideal Rankine cycle, I can substitute H2 for H2S and H4 for H4S. Although if it was an ideal Rankine cycle, maybe I can use the Carnot efficiency too. So here's a quick example where we already have a system that's uh, that's got a state table in it, right? So here I know that at state one entering the turbine, I'm at six megapascals and 500 degrees. At state two coming out of the turbine, I'm at 0 0.01 megapascals and a quality of 60% or 0.6. When I get out of that condenser, I've condensed the fluid, right? So now this is a saturated liquid. I'm at the same pressure, right? And then I pump this back up to some state 4S that's at 7.5 megapascals. Now this state table is pretty nice to us. It gives us all the specific enthalpy values. On a test, maybe you'll get some of these values but you'll also undoubtedly be given the opportunity to demonstrate that you understand how to find specific enthalpy in different cases, like potentially out of an ideal turbine and then using an isentropic efficiency to find the outlet of a real turbine. Or maybe I give you the real outlet of the turbine and ask you what the isentropic efficiency is. Either way, in this case, we have all this information in our state table. So that means I can put this information into my equation for ice or for thermal efficiency. This is nice because I have the values. I just plug them into my calculator and hope that I don't mess up. And I get that my thermal efficiency in this case is 55.3% or 0.553, right? I can multiply this by 100%. I get 55.3%. And you might be thinking, well, why is it so low, right? Why isn't this 100%, right? So really, to figure out if this is a good efficiency or a bad efficiency, we'd want to compare to the Carnot cycle, right? So what does the Carnot efficiency for this problem look like? And remember, Calvin and Planck told us that in order to get power from heat in, we have to reject heat. This is one of the problems with Rankine cycles, right? One of the reasons why we like to go to systems like natural gas power plants, because when we're cooling down water, right, from steam to liquid, we have to reject a lot of heat, right? And all the heat that we reject is heat that we can't get out from the turbine, right? So this is because we know the net heat is also equal to the net work. So part of the reason why the thermal efficiency is low in these Rankine cycles is because we have to condense the fluid and that takes a lot of heat to be rejected to move from steam back to liquid. Now, the reason we don't necessarily mind doing this, and one of the reasons why this was the first type of power plant that we developed, was that we like to be able to pump this up from a liquid to a high pressure liquid because this pump takes much less power than this turbine. So how can I sort of look at that, right? How do I define that as a different characterization parameter? So when we have these types of heat engines, we'll also talk about something called the backwork ratio. So the backwork ratio tries to remind us that the first consumer of power from the power plant is the power plant itself, right? So in order to run the power plant in a cycle, I'm producing power at the turbine, but I'm also consuming power at the pump. So the backwork ratio tells us how much of the turbine power we have to feed right back into the power plant 
in order to run the pump. Back work ratio for Rankine cycles are going to, is going to be the magnitude of the pump power divided by the magnitude of the turbine power. <coughs> Excuse me. So if every component here is one inlet and one outlet, and we're at steady state, so the mass flow rate through the turbine is the same as the mass flow rate through the pump, the back work ratio for this four-component Rankine cycle is going to be the magnitude of the pump power, which is H4 minus H3, divided by the magnitude of the turbine power, which is H1 minus H2. So let's calculate this for our example here. Here, we see that our pump power, the magnitude of our pump power, is 7.6 kilojoules per kilogram. So this is the pump power per unit mass flowing through the system. Whereas the same quantity for our turbine is 1,788.9 kilojoules per kilogram. So our backward ratio is quite low, right? So less than half of a percent. So this is the reason why we kind of like these Rankine cycles is because we don't have to consume very much of the power that's generated in our power plant just to run the power plant. So from a backward ratio perspective, this looks good because most of the power we're producing in the turbine finds its way out to the grid. So there's two ways we characterize these Rankine cycles. One is by thermal efficiency, and another is by backwork ratio, which kind of reminds us that the power plant is the first consumer of the power plant. So this is a pretty low number, and low numbers are good, right? So backwork ratios are, I don't know, kind of like golf. I don't play golf because my scores are too high, but I understand that in golf, you're supposed to have low scores, right? So because 0.4% of the work goes back into the pump, 99.6% goes into the generator, right? So that's, that's pretty good. So that concludes our lecture for today. Uh, just before the midterm, so next class, we will uh, do an example. So that's tomorrow. We'll do a longer rank and cycle example. So you'll see what that looks like, which is something that you certainly could see on the exam. And then on Monday, um, I'll come prepared to answer uh, any questions that you have about thermodynamics. And then uh, if we don't exhaust the time doing that, then I'll kind of go through at least certain parts of my review lecture. So if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to field those now. All right, if not, have a great day and I will see you tomorrow. Thanks very much.